Hi everyone. Today I have a incredible episode of Agipro Interviews because I will be speaking to my friend and critically acclaimed author, um, screenwriter, soap writer. She was a model. She was someone that was incredibly political, um, especially in drawing attention to the plight of many African nations. She's done a lot of raising awareness for the issues going on internally in Sudan, where she is from. And I wanted to bring her to my website after being friends for several years, because I have been inspired so much by her work and how she is confident and compassionate in her views, but also is incredibly intelligent and astute. So I would like you guys to look into some of her work. I will list a number of her contact details at the very end of this podcast. This is my lovely friend, Cola Booth, and I hope you enjoy. So, Kola, I wanted to start formally and I wondered if you could tell people a little bit about where your story started, because I think what you went through as a child really led to you and a path for you into your adulthood. So could you talk a little bit about um, your childhood? I feel like I just came out of a complete brain fog, like born in Andromeda, Sudan. Uh, My birth parents were not equal. One was Arab, and, you know, the Arabs in Sudan are the high part of the society. A lot of them own slaves. And my father purchased my mother, who's a charcoal-skinned Ormo. And I thought I had a wonderful childhood at first because I didn't realize, like, we didn't know we were poor. Children who, until someone tells you you're poor, you know, until white people come there and tell you you're poor, you don't know you're poor, you're living in nature. Yeah. And so it seemed wonderful at first, but then um, my father, Hadi Ben Farouk, went against Nimri first. He went against uh, the president originally was Nimri, which was before I was born. But he went, he kept going against the government. They wanted to build Lake Nuba, and he was really against that. They wanted to... Uh, use up all the forests for charcoal or uh, creation or something like that. And he was against that. And he kept speaking out and he had a lot of privilege because he was what they consider white Arab. Yes. And he wanted to procreate. He wanted to get a pure black wife and procreate to have black sons because my Egyptian grandmother, Nejet Kek, had spent... Well, she claimed that the family spent 120 years breeding the black out of the family line. And so he wanted to be the person who brought it back in. And you have to know about him. He was educated in the south of France. Mm -hmm. He was very progressive thinking and radical. And so when he married my, well, purchased my mother and then married her, they, the Kobolkek family in Egypt, in, in Kam Ambo, Egypt, they really uh, disowned him for that. And so he settled in Sudan with my mother. And that is how, where I came in. That's where I was born and everything. Um, I can't really say that, what I can say is my personality and my inability to not speak up about things and my opinions and things because I realized if maybe I was quiet and never you know gave my opinion or never said anything in public maybe uh different factions of people who consider me controversial and hate me they might leave me alone if they thought well you know she's piped down and all that I want to pipe down I would love to be uh subdued and more mellowed out But the problem is that I witnessed my parents murdered in front of me. And so Mm. I have this uncanny knowledge that we can die at any minute. At any minute, we can just not be here all of a sudden. And so you have to, I feel, um, you owe it. You have an obligation to nature and the universe that if you feel you are witnessing injustice or cruelty or whatever, um, you have to combat it and speak up about it. 
My way of doing it is that I'm a storyteller. And that doesn't mean just on paper. In every facet of my life, I can't help it. I'm just a storyteller. I sort of give you a character of what I believe. Because remember, Cola Booth is not my real name. No, your name's Naima. Right, my real name is Naima Ben Harid. And so I use Cola Booth as sort of like a character I play. But the character is 100% me. It's what I think and feel. I have just created this dramatic way because I'm a drama queen. <laughs> <laughs> so I've created this dramatic way to kind of present the stories that I'm telling. Where did the the name Cola Booth come from? Because I've seen you mention this. It, it, there's a lot of connotations with the meanings of the words. Right. I wrote a two-word poem many years ago um, in the 90s, and the two-word poem was Cola Booth. Now, let me tell you the reason. was When I came to America, I couldn't speak English. So the psychiatrist, because I was an outpatient at a mental institution because... I had witnessed my parents' murder in mm. Sudan. So when they brought me to America, I was just a, a total basket case. And the psychiatrist said she needs a friend. And so silent films is what they gave me because you don't have to know English to understand silent films. And sure. so Greta Garbo, uh, Pola Negri, Joan Crawford, uh, Clara Bow, and Betty Boop. Those were like yes. my iconic heroes. And so I wanted to have a name like, like Betty Boop or Greta Garbo. or You know, I wanted to have a name like that. And so I took cola, which is the favorite snack of children in Africa. It's the cola nut. And it's just a very unique thing. Chinua Achebe said, if you, when you bring the people cola, you bring the people life. Oh. And then Boop. Booth is the elephant ear drum. It's a drum that the topping of it is elephant ear. And in war, they use that drum to pass messages about how the war is progressing. So I took Cola and Booth to be an African version of Betty Booth and Greta Garbo. I see. And it represents both sides of your personality because you can right. you can it do both. It represented all of that, that at the time meant so much to me. I mean, it just all meant so much to me. Now it doesn't as much. But I mean, at that time, that really meant a lot to me. And so I took that as my name. Yes. But once again, in America, um, they just make fun of my name. Nobody ever... Well, there was one newspaper called The Stranger in Seattle, Washington, that did a story praising my name, saying, best name ever. That was the title of the story. Okay. But other than that, I'm constantly ridiculed here about my name. And I think my name is really fantastic. I think Cola Booth, it has a lot of meaning. It, ha- it sounds good. It's succinct. Nobody else has that name. If you Google it, only I will come up. If you search on Amazon, only I will come up. That's what I wanted. I didn't want to have like a name similar where someone else would come up with me. Yes. You know what I mean? And so that's where that name came from. That's such a wonderful question. I'm so happy you asked me that. That's okay. Um, I've heard you do an interview with your adopted mom, um, who you, I think you live with in Miami. Is that right? Who and you were adopted through UNICEF, I think. And you, there was an right. interview I had where your mom was talking about your childhood, and I wanted to hear like your experience of being adopted by Black Americans versus the Sudanese people you grew up with because I think when you've spoken um, to me before and we've spoken online about your experience it kind of gave you a contrast that you could see between the black American story and the kind of like history that's been kind of warped um, especially from an African position and I didn't know if if you could talk a little bit about that because I think a lot of people are a bit oblivious to the actual history of what happened and you're really a historian and you I've I've looked at various books and um, notes that you've you've brought forward because I wanted to learn more so I didn't know if you could talk a little bit about your experience being adopted in such a lovely family and um, what that gave you as a contrast right it was Washington DC where I grew up and when I first came the first night I came they had was called my black American family had what's called a block party, which is where all the neighbors are out in the street partying and this and that. I couldn't speak English and I was absolutely terrified of 
black Americans because they are vastly different. They are like completely worldly different from people in Africa. When you first encounter black Americans in person, it's like meeting people who look West African, but they are very European. I mean, they are, they are European. That's how to the African eye they come off. It's like, these are Europeans, but there's some kind of joke being played because they look like West Africans. And so, um, also, though, I was a fearless child. I mean, that was the one thing that did come out of my parents being murdered in front of me, is that I really, and I'm still that way, I don't really fear anything. I have this thing that comes out in me that I just, I'm not I'm a fearless person. So I went right into them. I went right into their arms. Um, and luckily, they were very perceptive, loving people. I mean, we couldn't even speak the same language. Yet they knew what I was thinking and feeling all the time. And they would always be there to hold me up and support me. They were very concerned because, like I told you, I was an outpatient in a psychiatry ward at the same time mm. that I was, you know, being readjusted into this family. But black Americans, like both of us come from a history of slavery. My father purchased my mother in Sudan. And then in uh, Washington, D.C., my black American family, they are from Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia. Okay. And they come from 400 years of slavery. Yes. And so, and I'm coming from 1,500 years of, of Arab slavery. <laughs> and so, even though both come from a slave background, theirs is really vastly different because they don't have their names. They don't have their tribe. They don't have clan. I have all that. Mm. You know, they don't have anything of their past. They're like people who have been forced to have amnesia by the slave owners they had, and they are extremely abused. And so, because their hearts are broken, they are such magical people. You know, I've always said that, is that black Americans are magical because their hearts are broken. And uh, my family, the black Americans who adopted and raised me, were extremely loving, giving, empathetic people and notoriously concerned with me retaining my history, knowing my history, knowing their history. Mm -hmm. And when you were saying I'm a historian, that's where that comes from. I was actually trained by them to always research. And I didn't know I was going to be a writer at that time, like when I'm a little kid. I didn't know that, but they trained me to do two things, Josie. They trained me to read the newspaper every day and then write a short paragraph about what I read. Okay. And yeah, and then that was a chore I had to do, which I, once I got used to it, I liked it. And then they also just trained me to always seek out information about everything, any and everything. And so I could become obsessed with Catherine Hepburn. And then within a few years, I could be able to tell you her entire life, her family's life, what it was like in New England in the 1800s. Mm. That's where all of that part of me comes from, is from I just have been taught and trained to research and look into things. So it was a wonderful childhood. That was one of, I think that's the best luck I've had in life. And I've had a very lucky life, mm. even though I've had a horrible life. You know, and I don't know if people can understand what I mean by that, but I've had this horrible, horrible life, yet I've always been extremely lucky. As one of my girlfriends said to me, if you get raped, it's Osama bin Laden. <laughs> you know, it's someone yeah. that catapults you to fame and you make money off it. Now, that's how, not how I see it, of course, because I'm the person who actually experienced that. Yes. But I'm just saying that has been my life is that uh, incredibly, uh, I've just had incredible things happen to me all my life, but I always come out of it lucky. Something lucky happens that makes me come out okay.
I was going to ask you a little bit about that, um, but before I do, I was wondering if anyone was to want to research a little bit more about the history of the North African slave trade and all of the information that I think you've shared in interviews I've listened to before, a lot of people, even American people, um, were completely oblivious to things that are going on in Libya. I know you were one of the first people that I saw speak about the current state of um people in Libya right. and I I think that a lot of people are a bit oblivious to um, authors like Francis Bock who I think you've mentioned right. a few times yeah um, my good friend and you're working on a book with him I think is that coming yes Francis Bock and I are, have been writing a book called Dark Victory it's a murder mystery so it's entertainment but it also once you finish it you know everything about South Sudan. You will feel you know the people, the different tribes, um, the real feelings of the people. It will give you much more than the media yes. could ever give you. And at the same time, it's incredibly entertaining. I'm oh. so proud of that book. Yes, I can't wait to read it. Yeah, I can't wait for it to be released. Hopefully it'll come out next year, I pray. Okay. You've also written a book called Flesh and the Devil, which again is a novel, but it, it kind of s depicts the story of black America. And I, I wondered if you could right. share a little bit about that book. Flesh and the Devil is my favorite book of all the books I've written. And it tells the 20, it, it, it encompasses a 26,000 year love story between a man and a woman who they start off in ancient Africa and they keep being born and born all over again. And they keep coming back as black people, but at different times in history. Mm -hmm. And so they end up in the American slave trade. They end up, cause I wanted to show black Americans what they were like in West Africa before they were slaves and then show them the real beauty of surviving slavery of, you know, because they have this feeling that everyone looks down on them. They black Americans feel that everyone puts them down and looks down on them for being slaves and this and that. I have a totally different view of that. I see them as incredible survivors. Yeah. We do something horrific and they were abused and crushed, and yet they came up like a phoenix and are more resilient and beautiful than ever. And so that's what I wanted to show with Flesh and the Devil. But I love the story because it goes into the jazz age of, you know, Blinky, one of my characters in there. The woman becomes this jazz singer. It goes through the wars. It goes through the civil rights movement. And it comes all the way to modern times where now they're in interracial relationships and stuff. And so I just love that novel so much. And that was my love letter to Black Americans and to my Black American parents. So you are very passionate about your political view and your human rights views because you were raised Muslim, but you were adopted into a Christian upbringing. So you've right. seen how Christian um, views or Muslim views, although different, have both got negative qualities or you've seen how spiritual belief systems can you be used to control people. And I, I know you were developing a spirituality called the womb. And I wanted to know like what that kind of like, how that kind of impacted on your life and how you kind of moved through that because obviously when you came from a Muslim um, culture and then in America, I assumed that it was heavily the church. Like, how did that kind of impact on you um, growing up? Well, I am just terribly against injustice. People have to realize my start with Islam, being born Islamic, was witnessing slavery, you know, seeing people, the Dinka and Nor and Shilluk tribes around me being rounded up and enslaved, and women being completely dehumanized and degraded. And so I just had, from the very beginning of life, a very psychologically scarred experience with Islam, um, including my body being cut on, you mm -hmm. know, from birth, having them decide things about me uh, biologically and cutting me up and I'll never ever be normal. I'll never ever have a normal sex life. I'll never, I mean, 
I don't want people to think I can't have sex or anything, but what I'm trying to say is that we have ritual uh, vaginal cutting over there, and not just that kind of cutting. There's all kinds of other things that people don't talk about that are done to newborns and to children, all based on superstitions. In this case, my case, coming from Islamic superstition. Yes. And so I started, Josie, from just complete dejection by this religion that over there we have Sharia law, so we don't yeah. have a separation of church and state. So it was just my natural... Um, I just naturally don't like injustice, what I feel is injustice. Yes. And so I rebel against it, and I never liked Islam. And then I had always been raised at the same time that the white people were the white devils. And so America was the white devils, and they are Christians, and their whole religion is like a lie. And the whole thing is evil and demonic, and they're really... Satan worshippers and they're white so they can't be good you know mm -hmm. that's how we were raised in Sudan so then um, Owen McCandless a white man was the person who facilitated my adoption he was the person that when my Egyptian grandmother went to the mullahs to get permission to put me up for adoption mm -hmm. he was the person from UNICEF who I was given to and so for one year because it took a long time. I was uh, six years old when, when I, he came and got me. So, you know, it's not easy to place a child that's already big. And uh, I, for one year, he was basically my surrogate father. Mm. And it was wonderful. And so everything I had been taught against white people, um, I had to unlearn that because I had this wonderful white man who was Irish and taught me so much about his Irish culture and his background. And then he had an Irish girlfriend who was just fascinating. And mm -hmm. they took me to the UK. And I mean, they were really like parents to me for a year. And so that was a breakthrough for me because it changed my whole perception of what I had been taught by Islam. Yes. Because they were wonderful, loving people. And then I got adopted in America. And then at first, I loved Christianity. I just thought it was, you know, I had been lied to. These aren't white devils. This isn't. And even though I was a black American, America is still an overwhelmingly white nation. Yes. So I, what I'm trying to convey is that now here I am in a country where, like, everybody on TV is not Arabic. The women aren't wearing a hijab. Everybody here, <laughs> they're all white people on TV and stuff. So I was supposed to see that as, oh, the white devils. But I saw America as like this wonderland, and I was in the ghetto in Washington, D.C. My family lived in Anacostia Park, southeast Washington, D.C., which is a ghetto area, but I never was able to see it that way. I just thought it was complete paradise because all the children had shoes on. <laughs> you could get cooked food at any moment of the day, like McDonald's or any place. We didn't have that in Sudan. So it was a wondrous paradise to me. And I never did know. I was just ignorant and oblivious to, you know, people saying, oh, what's it like to, you know, grow up around crime in the ghetto? And I just never, ever experienced that. I thought I was in a wonderful paradise. And I thought Christianity was wonderful until my late teens and also when I started to really understand and experience white racism in America, mm -hmm. that is when my whole thing of not liking injustice kicked in. And I started to really not like Christianity anymore because I realized it was so oppressive, especially to gay people. Yes. It was just very wrong to me. And also, rape was not covered in the Bible. It was mentioned so far as <clears throat> if you rape a woman, you should pay her father. Yes. You know. But the woman herself, it, it, there's no mention of her feelings or anything about her as a human being. It's all dealt with through him. Yes, and that's, and that's also in the laws, isn't it? Mentioned. It's reflected. And so how can you tell the story of the world when rape from day one is one of the leading tenets and stories of human race? 
And so I just felt that the Bible was not, you know, I felt, because see, in Sudan, even though we were forced to be Muslims, that's outdoors, you're a Muslim, but indoors, you're secretly practicing hika, which is like a, a ancient Egyptian, uh, they consider that the voodoo of Sudan. Mm -hmm. And so when I got grown, I realized that hika was to me, the, which is the womb, when I talked about creating my religion, the womb. Yes. It's basically, uh, well, it's part of Hika. And um, I just wanted something that acknowledged women as God and that I could feel good about. Because like in Hika, there are uh, all types of deities, gods. They even have two transgender gods. So yes. You see what I'm saying? It was very... Uh, human to me. It was just much more truthful. Yes, and, and it, it honoured femininity. Very, it's very interesting. Um, I obviously have read your book, which is an autobiography, which is Diary of a Lost Girl, and you go into this in a lot of detail, and it's just astounding that one person can go through all of this. So thank you for sharing it in a little bit more um, detail. But I think a lot of people um, know who you are, and as you mentioned earlier when we were chatting just before we started, that you've done so many interviews because of the connection with Osama bin Laden, and I know okay. you, this has been a kind of like a thing that's haunted you because um, I'll let you tell the story but it was something that was completely outside of your control when you were in Morocco and I wanted to um, know what not so much the story because I'm sure people can figure that out by reading your books and, and things like that but what what is the impact of that and how has that affected your life now because I know there's been a lot of repercussions Right. Well what people don't understand is that women in those countries don't have power we don't you know like people will always come up to me how could you date osama bin laden well there's no such thing as dating in morocco yeah you know that it's not that type of society westerners assume everybody lives like them and so they don't understand that i had no power i was there as a model um literally just snatched up by him in the wrong place at the wrong time and he took over my life for six months um, I never wanted to be with him. It wasn't a thing where um, there was some kind of love story that people don't understand that. So the fallout for me has been incredible rage and judgment against me as like a traitor mm. by the Western culture, um, by the Western people, white or black. That's on the one hand. And then the other hand is that the United States government forced me to, they orchestrated me to go on national TV and talk against him, which I didn't mind doing because uh, I just told the truth. I didn't lie. I just told the truth about what it was like to know him. He was a great poet. Um, he's probably the most sensitive person I ever met. He was like a genius. People don't know he never raised his voice. I'm telling you the good things first, so then I can tell you the bad things about his mama. <laughs> yeah. But he never raised his voice. He cried when he ordered people to be killed. He was extremely sensitive. He loved Whitney Houston. He just had a... He and Saddam Hussein both had a fixation on her for some reason that's unexplainable. The New York Times did a whole article about Sudan Hussein's obsession with Whitney Houston, and I was the person who revealed uh, Osama bin Laden's obsession with her. But aside from all that, he was very violent sexually, like during mm. sex, very violent, um, uh, just believed in racism in a way that not even white men do. I mean, to the point that to him, black people were less than human. We were, he really believed that, truly, that we were like three-fifths of a human. And therefore, anything you did to us was okay. And he really liked the company of black people because he liked feeling superior. Um, so I went and talked about all that. The U.S. government made me do that um, because I was being threatened with you know, being deported. And so after I gave all these interviews, talked about this on national TV, and I mean, I was on MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, all the top networks. And so 
I was asked by the government then to do things for them. And I know a lot of people, I think you guys over there, it's called MI5. Yes. And so, you know, they do a lot of covert operations and undercover things. And it was a similar situation in America where I was asked to do things that I felt were unethical and just wrong. You know, they want you to set people up, lie on people. These are people that they are trying to get them for some reason or another. Or the person might really and truly be a bad person. Yes. But the thing is that I don't want to break the law or lie on someone or tape record someone without their knowledge or do bad things to people on behalf of the government just so that they can, you know, that would, to me, destroy my soul. Yes. I mean, so it's I it's horrifying. Do it, and then after that, I pay to have these prices. I'm pretty sure your listeners can imagine what happens to people who don't become informants, who don't do it. You know, you find out that you're blacklisted and that you have a much harder time in society than you would have if you had cooperated. But at the same time, it looks like you sleep at night. Yes, and I think that it's, it's like... Um, the the American media as well as the British media, whenever there is a criminal or someone as extreme as a terrorist, they they treat the character as if they are a character of evil and they take away the human side of everyone and it becomes a play that's almost entertainment. And if you don't fit in that entertainment, you won't be rewarded in some way. So it was like an abduction that became a horrifying experience, not just because of what you endured when you went through that, but the repercussions of it after. So it's it's outrageous, really. But that I wanted, I think the way I wanted to conduct my website and the reason why you're one of the first people I asked to feature and be an interview is because I feel like everything is propaganda. And, and the reason why I call my website Agitprop, which is kind of like the Russian propaganda, is because I wanted it to be anti-propaganda and to see people... Right for like who they are and what they've been through. So thank you right. for, for sharing. And I know one I'm of your, sure sorry, go ahead. On some level, my work is propaganda too, in a way. I mean, we all, I think I have an agenda. You know, I think I do as a womanist, you know, feminist, as a black activist, as an African rights advocate, I think I probably have an agenda too. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I think that people should admit that that, you know, notice that about yourself and admit it because, I don't know, I think all of us have an agenda. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I really do. I don't know why I'm coughing. Like it's all right. I have no <laughs> idea. But I really commend you for saying that about propaganda because, yes, I think that's one of the worst things right now going on in the West and the world is that we are constantly being told what to think, um, how to look at something, how to this, like you said, they want everything to be one dimensional. Mm. And um, it's so it's so hard to break through that, you know, and my autobiography, so many people just thought this is too much. Nobody could live through this. This is like a made up story. Mm. But I will go to my grave telling people that my autobiography is the most truthful because, of course, I'm telling the truth from my point of view. I'm telling my truth. Yes. And so it's the most truthful autobiography ever written. That's the reason why it's so compelling. If it was all a lie, I don't believe that it would have the effect it has on people, especially black women who read it, really find themselves taken to, like one woman told me, you write the way Aretha Franklin sings. Mm. You know, your book really affected me. It got under my skin. It really made me feel all these things. And that's because, Josie, as incredible and crazy as my story sounds, I'm telling the truth. And yes. truth is stranger than fiction. I mean, that's just a fact of life. Truth really is stranger than fiction. But I also have to tell you something, and this is so important. The truth does not set us free. That is what my life has taught me my entire life. Telling the truth does not really set you free at all. In my case, it really has caused me to be persecuted and misunderstood. That's what I feel. 
And like I said, I'll go to my grave saying that I told the truth mm. as as creatively as I decided to do it because I, of course, I have done it dramatically with characterization and stuff. But at the same time, I told the truth, which is why it affects people. That's why they relate to me or respond to me is because really people can tell when they're hearing the truth. Yes. You know, and nobody gets it. You can't just, you can't pretend to be me. You can't make up what I'm, you know, no one could just make up Cola Booth. No. This is a real experience that is happening, but it will take like a hundred years for people to really decode it and understand that I was really one of the greatest truth tellers it was. Yes. I mean, that's how I feel. And I give myself credit for that no matter what anybody says. But I have to tell you, you pay a price in this life for telling the truth. It yes. doesn't set you free. Your um your career at the time, you were working with soaps and you were doing a lot of writing for Days of Your Lives. Is that the right one? Days of Our Lives in D.C., right. Right. And, and that actually aired in, in, in England for years and it's coming back to the U.K. I don't know if it's back on yet, but it's been picked up to be on, I think, Channel 4 there. Okay. And so that will be back on the U.K. soon. And I also wrote for Young and the Restless, which is a CBS soap, and that's the number one soap in the United States is the Young and the Restless. So you um, you would you were working behind the scenes with both of those soaps, and because of the connection that came out, and I must say as well, a lot of the details that you put in your autobiography were validated after everything came to the forefront of the media much later on. So it was like kind of justification in some ways, but as you said, the truth doesn't always set you free because telling the truth actually cost you um, the job as a writer because the sponsorships pulled out. Right. Um, it was just such a controversy here because the Osama bin Laden thing, she was born a Muslim, and a lot of people here are terrified of Muslims. And even though I'm not a Muslim now, and I have actually denounced Islam, uh, that doesn't register. To white people, especially in America, once a Muslim, always a Muslim. Many of them see them as just terrorists and undesirables. And when, you know... Days of Our Lives, the soap I was writing for, they had a, uh, they were the Bible Belt soap. So that means white bread, really white viewership, not a lot of blacks or urban viewers. And so a lot of people wrote and they were very upset to find out that a black woman was writing the show. Gosh. That really upset them terribly. And um, people were just very cruel to me, uh, Josie. That was the first time that, because I was, when I was fired from that show, because the sponsors, which was Jeff Peanut Butter and Tide Detergent, said, we're going to pull out if you don't get rid of her. And so NBC forced the producers to fire me. The producers actually fought for me. They fought for at least two weeks, which was really unusual, but they were really behind me. And well, the ratings that went up. And so that's why they wanted me there, I suppose. Yes. But once I was fired, I tried to move to another popular soap opera called All My Children. <laughs> and that was the first time that a rumor was put out that I was transgender. Right. And I actually didn't get that job because of that rumor. That's how it was back in 2006. Yeah. Maybe now today, maybe today they would uh, not care about something like that. But, you know, for your listening audience, I'm six foot three. I don't feel that I look anything like a man. In person, I don't feel I look uh, that someone would think that. But they use no. my height. They would always say, well, you know, she has to be uh, gene uh, surgically made and all these kinds of things. God. And so that's when that started. And you get tormented and terrorized for that as well. And so now that became a new thing that ignorant men or you know how people are yes. and so that became a whole new way of torturing me and um i lost a major job i've never gotten over that i just felt like it's so ridiculous you know i'm a writer what has that got to do with whether she was transgender yes it would it shouldn't matter anyway 
it's crazy and i think that it's funny as well particularly because you're a mom of two two boys and you you've right it's it's just a way i think of people trying to force you to stay below them in any capacity they can and, and right. it's shameful really but right, because they also spread the rumor that i supposedly um am cannibal that i eat human flesh because remember <laughs> i have been talking about my religion the womb Yes. Which progressed on to, I went all the way on back to Hika. And so they connected that to, well, you know, she uh, practices this ancient religion and they eat people. And um, they said I did animal sacrifices, which I have never done. Goodness ever sake. in my life. And my friend, at the time, I was a good friend of the rap star Azealia Banks. And yeah. she actually does do uh, animal sacrifices. Uh, sacrifices in her religion which is called Santeria and so um, because I was friends with someone who did that they tried to say that I was practicing voodoo and doing that another rumor they spread is that I'm a communist which is absolutely ridiculous I support Elizabeth Warren right now yes. for president of the United States and I, before her I voted for Hillary Clinton I'm a Democrat I'm a liberal Democrat I don't you know, but they make up all kinds of lies and disinformation. And this is happening to a lot of people around the world right now. I hear a lot of friends in England telling me it's going on there. They tell me all about MI5 and yeah. how people are being slandered. And, you know, uh, if you don't have the right politics. And really, there are no right politics because either side can attack you if they don't like you. Would you ever go back to TV writing or, or is your focus at the moment predominantly on writing your books and poetry? Because I know uh, you've also done some amazing food posts. So there's lots of things that you do that is incredible. So what would your ambitions be going forward? I would love to write for television more, but I frankly have been blacklisted in that medium. Um, and it's very difficult for me to get back in and I may never be able to again um, with publishing publishers still respond to me and they read my work and for some well I have a following you know I've sold a lot of books and yeah. so I, that seems to be open to me I haven't had anyone telling me oh no you can't be a part of this but the whole television which is much more money because that's instant money. You write, and then that week you get a check. Yes. And um, that has been really shut off from me. Um, I wrote a movie for Paramount Pictures, and I was paid an incredible sum of money. And now no one will talk to me in the industry in Hollywood. So I have really been blacklisted in that whole realm. And so um, I have just, for the past few years, honestly been living in a cloud of depression only recently have i forced myself to start coming out of my shell you know i don't do interviews mm -hmm. i'm only doing this because you're someone who i really respect we've chatted for years yeah and i look up to you and i oh. just have a love for you and i was like josie's always so kind to me i believe josie would present me as a fully complex human being and wouldn't try to hurt me or humiliate me in any way. No. And so that's why I wanted to do the interview with you. But um, I have just been a recluse. I mean, I have been a recluse. Soon I'm going to come out with a new video show where I film from my home talking about subjects that are dear to me just so that my fans can see I'm okay, that I'm alive, that I am healthy, um, because I had a real dramatic scare a few years ago with depression, and um, I'm coming out of it now. But um, it's it's just been such a difficult life. It's been I've like I said I've had a really horrible life, but at the same time I'm extremely lucky. You know, lucky things happen for me. I live in a mansion. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Even though I'm dirt broke. <laughs> I, that's I, because of my husband but I'm just saying no I think that like you are too valuable and you're too much of an incredibly 
astute person because when you try and source certain parts of the information that that could tell the stories especially around um black america and and looking into the history of many african um tribes and nations right. it's there is a very very disconnected resource to um learn from and i think a lot of the story hasn't been ordered in a linear fashion so people really do not know where to go i mean i think that a lot of people would like to know more and you have such an amazing way to um go through things like i was very interested hearing about how the connection between sudan and sudanese cultures and other cultures like there's so many monuments that i know that were destroyed at some point and there's a lot of lost sudanese right. history and right. where where else i don't know anyone that you speaks firstly English that would be able to actually tell people about this and this stuff is important I know at one point you recorded a song that I'm not sure which language it was sang in but I think it's called My Breasts Are Filled With Milk and Honey and right it, and that's a really ancient song which well, isn't you get available these songs and things from your when you're a child uh because think the average African child speaks five languages because you have to know the European language of your country in order to do trading. And then you have to know the dialects of your different grandma and, and auntie and all these different people um, who increasingly intermarry different tribes and things. And you have to know that. And most of those children know five languages, but they can't read a book. They can't write. Mm. They just know these languages. And another part of that is that you are taught ancient songs that, you know, the tribes, that's what a tribe is. They pass things on that are thousands of years old. Everyone keeps passing it on. Mm. And that's where those things come from. But nobody appreciates that from me. But I think, like, what I like to think about is Zora Neale Hurston the great American, you know, black American writer. In the 30s and 40s, she wrote a lot of anthropological essays about different cultures where she had traveled to the West Indies and traveled around to places and Native Americans and things. And no one appreciated it when she was doing it. Now, though, now that she's been dead for 80 years, people are really into it there's been this renaissance so maybe one day people will care to listen to the songs i sang and things that i shared from my culture maybe one day they will but it just right now it just isn't i mean black americans here when i have readings and things people just uh are not interested in in that stuff and it's sad for me because I mean, that's all I know to do is to leave it in, to put it out into the universe, to put Mm. it into the world. But I have been just so misunderstood and not appreciated on every level. I appreciate you. (laughs) No, I I really appreciate the um, project you put together called Volcano Woman because it was a graphic novel that was beautifully presented. Um, It was illustrated by a, a fabulous young lady, I think, and a team of people. And it told the story of um, the gods and and creative beings, but in a way that would translate to a younger audience, maybe. So what was the kind of intention behind that project? Well, Volcano Woman was my comic book. I'm so thankful to God. And that's what I mean by lucky, because all my life, one of my dreams was that, oh, one day I'm going to do this comic book that's in my head. I have that in my head since like 14 when I first learned English and I fell in love with American comic books. And so just by luck, someone came and wanted to um, invest in Mm -hmm. that project. And so I ended up being able out of the blue to do it much earlier than I ever thought I would be able to do it. And it was wonderful. I did Volcano Woman, though, because I really don't like Storm. You know, Storm is the famous X-Men character who is a black woman. But I hate her blonde hair. I hate her blue eyes. And so I wanted to do a real Africoid vision 
of African women superheroes who actually look African. Yes. And so that really was the whole driving force of why I did Volcano Woman. And I'm praying that something will happen to make me able to bring it back out. But I'm just proud and happy that it was. It has been established. It has existed, and people know about it. Mm. And the people who did read it really loved it. Yes, it was a really, really awesome insight. And I like that you had LGBT characters in the forefront. And oh, yeah. it was just a One natural day. One of the superheroes was a black man, right? Yeah. The very first black male superhero. So it was very, very, very cool. Um, what do you want to do? Have, if there was a project you could do that you've not tackled before, maybe literary or in different forms of media, what would that be? I would love to make a film. Okay. Um, yeah, that's been my dream because, see, when I write a novel, it comes to me as a movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't get spirits or visions or, you know, other black writers always say that the characters came to them. I don't get that at all. What I get is a movie, and then I write the book version of the movie. Yes. And that that has happened with every book I've written. You're reading the book version of the movie that came to me. And so I would like to actually make a film. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I started as an actress. That's yes. what I wanted to be. And I never would make it as an actress because I'm too tall. And so, um, but I would love to direct a movie. I'm too old now to be acting in the kind of roles that I envisioned myself in. You know, I'm now 50 years old. And so... Um, but you you could I be just, any I age. I don't have that desire. I don't have that desire is what I'm saying actress anymore sure but i would love to direct a film and i have so many film ideas you know on different budgets and i love horror films i really have this thing where um all my life i love scary movies oh my god i didn't know that oh yeah i'd love to do a black scary movie but i wouldn't put my name on it okay (laughs) (laughs) but i just would love to because i love watching scary movies Oh, I'm so scared of them. I never can watch them. Wow, yeah. I'm <laughs> so opposite. I love horror films. And I um, just, that's something I'd like to do. But I would just love to do something that has to do with films. I sure. would really love that. You know. That would be and pretty I'm amazing. Praying, like I said, and I'm asking your audience, pray that my novels continue to come out. I haven't had a release in seven years. So, um, but that's really been my fault so far because I have really uh, not turned in things. The way I've turned in several books, but if there's a lot in there that I mainly blame myself, but just pray that I'm able to continue putting my books out because that's my real passion in life is just writing stories, fiction. Mm-hmm. And um, I would just like if God would allow me to be able to do that. Yes. So you you were part of the kind of Hollywood circle for quite some time because you lived in California for a while. Right, And yeah. you mentioned earlier um, when we were discussing about um, Osama's obsession with Whitney Houston, and she was actually your friend, which I think is right. fabulous. Um, in the UK, particularly at the moment, they've been releasing a lot of the documentaries surrounding Whitney. Um, and obviously, I think in the US... Robin, who was her friend in life, um, has been doing several interviews recently. And I I wondered what you could share about that, because I always find it strange, because when you think of a superstar like Whitney Houston and then you kind of have people discussing her many years after she sadly passed, it's always like, I don't know how to feel about it, even when people come out in her defence. So as her friend and someone that knew her, what what is your view on that? Well, because I knew Whitney... I know that she would be terribly upset Mm. that Robin revealed their relationship and that Whitney was gay, um, well, bisexual. And um, at the same time, I like Robin, and I feel she did it with great class and dignity. I don't feel that she injured Whitney in any way. I understand why she told her story, and I understand Uh, why it was important socially at this time that we have, you know, major images that are positive 
to look up to and say, well, you know, Whitney Houston was bisexual, so it can't be all bad. You know, yes. I understand that whole need for that. But I'm just saying, as someone who knew Whitney as a person and her feelings and stuff, she never wanted that known. No. You know, she, for whatever her reason was, she didn't want that known. So if it had been me, of course, I would have respected that and never talked about it. Um, I actually believe she preferred men much more than women. Mm -hmm. And this is just from conversations I had with her. She really genuinely liked sex with men. Genuinely, really was, you know, loved men. And um, she was one of the funniest people I've ever met. She was so kind. And she was just very nice. I just can't rave enough. You know, she was so fragile. Mm. I think that's what people don't realize. She put on this tough girl exterior. But the minute she could detect that you were someone that she could let down her guard with, you saw this very fragile little girl. And I think she was deeply affected. Maybe she was meant to be gay. Mm. Maybe, um, you know, it, it is possible to pressure someone. I know this is being a, a Christian. Um, it's, it's possible. And she was from a very Christian background. Yes. And so it's possible to be pressured. Um, she told me the story one time. She went to Aretha Franklin's house. And Aretha made a comment about how she was sitting with her legs like a boy. Sitting, you know, and told her, people are going to think you're a dyke. You know, you shouldn't sit like that. And, this, and that devastated Whitney. Wow. It devastated her. And... You can see the devastation on her face. That's one of the few moments I had with her because all our moments were intimate and alone, just us two. Mm. Well, her friend Ulysses, uh, Ulysses was at one thing, but he was in another room. But you could see in her that maybe she was meant to be gay and they had her to go another way and she learned to like the other way. Mm. You see what I'm saying? She yes. learned to like it, and it became like, okay, I'm normal, and I'd rather be normal. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people, that's just how deep homophobia goes. Mm. And um, But she was extremely fragile. There was just a little girl, and she felt very betrayed by her fans, by black fans. She okay. felt betrayed because they would, retweet the pictures of her in the drug den in her bathroom and these ugly pictures of her drugged mm. out and stuff. And she just felt, how can they do that if they love me? You know, how can they help the corporate structure make fun of me? And then Hollywood enjoyed everybody was just had a field day making fun of her and laughing at her, not really seeing her as a person. And um, she was very sad. I mean, she was a very sad, but funny, but loving woman. And I really miss Nippy. That was the name that she always made all of us call her, was Nippy. And um, I just can't think of someone that, I don't know, she was just so sweet, Josie. She was so different from the public image of, you know, of how she was shown. Mm. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that because obviously she was such an icon to so many people that it's it's funny to see the human side of her and hear it from you, so thank you. Um, who were yeah. the people that you looked up to when you were growing up, maybe uh, apart from the silent film stars we've spoken about, were there musicians? Because I know you you mentioned some of your favourites online sometimes. I was wondering if oh, yeah. there was anyone that really like struck a chord. <laughs> What I really loved as a kid, well, the first thing I was made fun of on my block because the first two artists I really loved were Olivia Newton-John and the Go-Go's, who were white women singers. Okay, in from Greece. In neighborhood, an all-black neighborhood, it was just weird. It was like, <laughs> why is she into them? And I was really into Olivia Newton-John and the Go-Go's. But then I became into Motown. Okay. And I love, I mean, really my favorite singer of all time is Diana Ross. Yes. And a lot of people feel, well, she's not a great singer. But to me, she just was so much more than a singer. I just felt she was this great 
she reminded me of East African women in this way of being this great goddess image who was an actress. Um, she was a storyteller to me, and she was just full of love, even though she was considered a real bitch. <laughs> you know, that's how the, you know, the image of her was. And yet, watching her concert, she just seemed to ooze love. Mm. And um, I just loved Diana Ross. She was my very favorite. And then I went through my Lauren Hill period. I love Lauren Hill. Yes. I think Lauren Hill is just so great, and I wish she had done a lot more. She, I was angry at Lauren for a long time because I feel like she took herself away from us. Mm. And she didn't want to be a star. Now I understand it, but at the time I was so mad at her. She's my favorite. And then, <laughs> and then I love Madonna. Yeah. Madonna was just, I just, as an artist, I just feel, I wish I could have been Madonna as far <laughs> as, yeah, as far as um, being able to just constantly reinvent yourself. And, but because that's basically already who I am as far as I keep telling you, it's like I do characterizations and, I'm a storyteller. Yes. And I feel like she had the freedom to change with every video. She was doing what I want to do with books. I wish that I could be out there. It's, I have to fight for years, Josie, just to get a book out. Yes. And so I am really, you know, under glass. But I wish I could be like her as far as if they would let me be my what I want to be then they would just see me constantly coming out with all... I would write books that people would be shocked that why is a black woman writing this? Like, I have one novel I really want to write called Joan Crawford's Revenge. Okay. And it's like nothing else you've ever read. You would be shocked that why is a black woman writing this shit? But it's, you know, I don't know if we can cuss on your show. But oh my God, of course you can. Like, yeah, go but, ahead. Um, Joan Crawford's Revenge is just won't leave me alone. I've written like a hundred pages of notes. And I'm like, this is the most, because Joan's in the book. All through the book, I'm having like this fictionalized life of Joan Crawford. And I just wanted to tell, because I don't believe she's the monster that she was made out to be. No. No, I do agree. I, I'm pretty sure she did abuse her daughter. But what I hate is they never tell you that at 14 years old, Joan was a maid and a prostitute. Yes. They don't tell you how badly her mother beat her and that that's just how she was raised. And I just love her so much because when I first came to America, I watched her silent films. And so she became family to me. Mm. And I just feel this need to defend her. And so, but the book would be fabulous. And it would be a book where people would say, I can't believe a black woman from Africa wrote this. <laughs> and it's fucking the bomb. You know, everybody would be going, this is such a great book. She's always yeah. fascinated me. They're, like I, I'm always intrigued by the things that these these early Hollywood char characters they like. Did she have something called the buckle where they pulled her back teeth out so it would give her more of a right. sculpted face? Like you can't even like right. imagine the like the yeah, it's right. unreal. But it's what, what these women she went was through. So devoted. She was so devoted to creating what Hollywood wanted to create. Mm. And that is just, uh, I understand it, though. As crazy as what she did sounds, I understand that kind of thinking of, okay, they want me to be this larger than life. And it, remember, all the women were doing it. Yes. Greta Garbo, Betty David, everybody was creating Hollywood. And so Joan was competitive. And so she was probably the best one at creating this fictional, outrageous dream. Because it really was a beautiful dream that she was creating. And she was willing to cut up her body for it. Yes. And like Cher, you know, think of Cher had two ribs removed to have the perfect figure. And so it continued that willingness to... Um, I wouldn't have ribs removed, but I understand <laughs> it. Yes. I relate to it. One of your um, early kind of projects when you were moving into writing was a movie based on one that Joan Crawford had starred in as a, as a prostitute. Is that right? Yes, Rain. Rain. That, because what I wanted to show, and it's a very famous story written by Somerset Mom. Everyone 
a lot of people in literature will know where brain is. Mm -hmm. The story of Sadie Thompson. And what I wanted to do, because see, Sadie Thompson is being harassed by a reformer, a, a Christian minister who's trying to make her become, you know, it would be interesting if Sadie was prostituting in order to start her own church. And so that's my whole womanism coming out. I Because I wanted to have my religion. Yes, yes. So kind of like the pariah because of her truth to femininity. Right, and so with Rain, that's what I wanted to do. Got it. That's pretty cool. Well, going forward, you're going to be doing um, some of your own content and it's going to be available on your YouTube series where you can talk through all your ideas and, and theories. And I think people would absolutely love to check that out. So when um, it comes out, I'll be able to share that on my site and point people oh, to your direction. Would so wonderful. It would be awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping March 3rd, which is my birthday. Okay. I'm hoping that that's when I will get the first one up. But with me... You never know, because I just go through, I have to do most of the work myself, and I also go through these feelings of everyone's against me, and so why bother, you know? Mm. I have I have to fight that every day. I, You don't know what I go through mentally. I really struggle, and I don't feel I'm mentally ill. I'm definitely not bipolar, none of that. I just have been so persecuted in a way, and I've been so unfairly treated by the business I'm in that yeah. um, I just feel like why do all this hard work and then no one's going to care you know nobody's going to watch nobody's going to and it it it's a hard thing to battle but I also feel on the other side that you must do this mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful documentary about the actress Hedy Lamar yes. who is responsible for creating the internet and everything and she says in there be good anyway Build it anyway. Make mm. the thing, you know, so inspirational to me the way she says, you know, you can't care about whether everyone will be against it or people won't support you or whatever. You have to do it anyway because one day, as showed with her, because she died and never got credit for the internet, but it became yes. a, an international thing. And so, um, oh no, it's Wi Fi. Wi Fi is what That's you're right. Doing. There's that fabulous so, image of her with the crown made of stars that kind of looks like right. the Wi-Fi symbol in a strange way, which right. hopefully I can find, I can try and put some reference to her in that in some way. <laughs> this is, you know, that's what inspires me a lot is her words saying that do it anyway. Even yes. if people are not going to come or not care, just do it anyway. I mean, I could die any day. Like I said, I could just fall out and die. Mm. And I would like, my work and the real me to exist you know what i'm saying because there's so many false images of me that are out there and so much so many lies about me and all through fictional cola that people make up their own fictional cola booth and just really a hateful thing about me and i'm nothing like that and so i would just like for something that is really purely me to exist yes well um Thank you so much for talking through so much of your life and your stories today. And I will link all your works that I can to the website. So, um, oh, thank you. Thank you again, Kyla. And, um, yeah, thank you everyone for listening. So thank you guys for listening through my interview with my wonderful friend Cola. Um, it was a privilege to speak to her because she's very busy in Miami at the moment. And I wanted you guys to look at her work. You can always find her books available on all good book retailers, but they're a very interesting selection of books. Whether they are novels, her autobiography is a very fascinating read. And I think the way that she describes things, it just is quite an, a... A uniquely beautiful approach to it paints a picture it paints a picture is the best way I can put it and it's a very three-dimensional image that she creates with her writing I was also so grateful to receive her 
graphic novel, Volcano Woman, and it was a very incredible project because it brought to the forefront many of the mythos that we are unfamiliar with in the West. Um, I was particularly intrigued by the stories in that in that particular comic book and I hope um, we source funding and continue that because it was a fantastic read. You can see how wonderful her work is from here. So thank you guys for listening. Please take care and I'll see you all in my next episode.